So as all of you have uh, been aware of the events going on in our world in the last 23 days, 29 days, 35 days, 300 days, eight years, the struggles that are going on in uh, eastern Ukraine, southern Ukraine, with Russia, with China, United States, all, it's a huge, huge issue, huge issue. So tonight, we're digging into a massively complex issue. This is, this is way bigger than a sermon, just to keep in mind. I am not going to tell you the right answer, because there isn't a right answer. There will be an answer that each one of you work out in your life. And then how you live that out is part of the preparation of the gospel of peace. In the armor of God, which is really interesting for Paul in a peaceable time to give an example of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives through the armor of warfare in Ephesians chapter 6 is a fascinating twist in Scripture. And one of the items of war that Paul says we ought to have is a have our feet shod. That means we're moving somewhere, we're going somewhere. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. To be prepared. One of the pieces of advice that Paul says to the church is be ready with an answer when somebody asks you as to the defense of your faith. So we'll be looking at that. There is not a right answer for this. In fact, I'm hoping to clarify some of the questions. Some questions are questions children ask. I watch American news, but more I watch BBC. And it'll be an hour full of news, and they're right in people's lives, asking them extremely difficult questions. So it's not something that we can dispense with in a couple of minutes. It's something that we really need to dig into. Our scripture for tonight is Romans chapter uh, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And I'm not actually explaining this. This is kind of the beginning of our springboard. Paul is writing to the church. The Roman Empire is, at this time, approaching its peak of power, of building, of empire development around the world, of crushing their enemies in foreign lands. It's from from Africa, the sub-Saharan area, all the way up to England and Scotland. The stretch of the Roman Empire was everywhere. Anybody that got in their way, they just crushed. I mean, they just destroyed them. And Paul is writing to the church a tiny little speck in the middle of this gigantic juggernaut. And this is what he says. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor each other above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil. But overcome evil with good. I know people in Ukraine. I work with companies here whose relatives are there. One of the huge questions that comes up is, when is the time to fight? When do we stop with rhetoric and just some help? and step up against evil. It's an incredibly difficult time. The two arrows that I have that are in this logo, the big red one and the little blue one, a lot of people are quickly quoting David and Goliath, trying to figure out how can, how can David win against Goliath. There's a book, and I don't remember who the guy is that wrote it, but it's a within the last decade, and it's called David and Goliath. And in that book, he looks at the story of David and Goliath from a totally new perspective. He says, when Goliath went out to war, he used old technology, heavy armor. He was incredibly loaded down, and he stood there and largely couldn't move. He was stuck. He was fearsome. He was a giant. He was extremely well equipped with the old weapons of war. David tried putting on those weapons, and they didn't work. He couldn't lift Saul's sword. The helmet didn't fit him. The armor kept sagging to his feet. So David used new technology new style, an, ent an entirely different understanding of even what the battle was, and picked up five smooth stones and put them in a little leather sling, which he had been practicing with all of his life. And he fought from the edge and from the shadows. This book says it was a battle that Goliath couldn't possibly win. If somebody had gone against him with the same weapons of war, Goliath would have easily won. Sword against sword, armor against armor, two gigantic juggernauts standing there slugging it out, he would have won. But it was a battle that David couldn't lose. We're finding out in the news that the Ukrainians have stopped the Russian army. They keep trying to get this huge old concept of war going, they're running out of gas. And they forgot to bring enough fuel to have their tanks run over and over and over. The tanks are loaded with incredible weaponry, but a grandmother can sneak up behind it and throw a glass bottle filled with gasoline through the window and stop the whole thing. It doesn't seem fair that somebody with nothing can stop an entire army. So the question then is, when does the real evil start? The big, big weapons. And do we do anything about that? This question has to do with how do we use power. I separate between power and authority. They're both spoken of in scripture a lot. Authority, the word for that in Greek is exousia. And exousia literally means com something coming out of you. It's who you are. Authority isn't something somebody can hand you. You have it because it is your identity. It's your role. It's, it's who you are in a situation. And coming out of that being is the ability to lead others and yourself to what is right. Not because you say so, but because it's right. 
Power is the word dunamis. We get our word dynamite from that. Dunamis, power, is the ability to bring about a result by manipulation or control. Not because it's right, but because you say so. So we're in a world in which the use of power up until 23 days ago, the whole world was saying, there's no way he's going to do this. He's not going to do it. He's all bluster. It's just talk. He's not going to really cross the threshold. I mean, why in the world would he do that? And he did. He's not going to fight against women and children. He's not going to bomb residential areas. He's not going to destroy hospitals and daycare centers. He's not going to target them. And he did. He's not going to go after the West right at the edge of Poland and some of the other countries in NATO. And he did. And so it's left us with a huge question. When do we do something? When do we stand up? When do we fight back? When do we, how do we use power against absolute evil? And within the Christian world, those questions are incredibly challenging. Very difficult. In some sense, to be sure, this is theoretical. It's only hypothetical for us while we sit here. The bombs are not dropping on our houses. Our bridges are not being blown up. Our children are not grabbing weapons to try and defend their grandmothers against an army coming down the street. We don't have a jurisdiction to decide yeah, let's launch, let's send planes, let's get in and go bomb. We can't, we can't do that. So from our perspective, this is a theoretical discussion. But it's also practical because we live in conflict where we work, sometimes in our own families or neighborhoods. When you're driving along, somebody cuts you off, and most of the time that's benign, but on occasion that becomes really confrontive. And we are in the middle of a battle, very small, but very real. And so the question is valid. When do we use power? There are there's some comparisons that I want to offer to you. One comparison is to be reactive, and the other is to be responsive. A reaction is when you are caught off guard, unawares, you didn't know it was coming. Some of the most heartrending stories that I've seen as I've been watching the news, and I've been watching a lot of it, that stuff on the, on, uh, online, are children who have no idea what's happening or why their parents aren't with them anymore or grandmothers or grandfathers whose houses have been destroyed saying a week ago, I never thought this would ever happen to us. It just never crossed my mind. Whenever you're in a situation that you have no plan for, you, ha you just refuse to think about it, you're in a place where you have to react. It's kind of like the doctor hitting the end of your knee, a little rubber hammer. And all of a sudden, your, your leg will bounce, not because you planned it, because you know what's going on, but because your body just reacts to some stimulus. And then you try and recover. So one side of this question is a reactive issue. When you're caught in a traffic jam, or people at work are losing their minds, or something happens you had no idea was coming, just never thought about it. You're compelled to react, and that's dangerous. The other is responsive, to be able to respond. One of the reasons why I'm bringing this up, and I may do another sermon on it next week, and we might even fill all four weeks because this is not going to go away quick. To respond is to have a plan. 
to understand what your options are and to choose the best option in the moment. A thoughtful approach to life. Now, of course, when this has come up, and I have friends in many different Christian traditions and a lot of non-Christian friends, the very first verse that comes up is Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. It's the first one that comes up. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is Jesus speaking. Keep that in mind. This is Jesus speaking. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So that's taken as the absolute answer. That's it. Slap on one cheek, turn the other cheek. What does that mean? One of the things that is a struggle for us is to understand a first century image from a 21st century point of view. In that day, every individual carried a weapon. Everyone had weapons. One of the things that really surprised us about Honduras when we went down there to start working, everyone has a machete, even little kids. Some are missing fingers and toes. Occasionally you see somebody without a hand. It was a machete accident. But there are kids that are three years old, five years old. And brush will start growing up, and the mom or dad will say, can you go trim that back? And a little four-year-old kid will go out with a machete and start whacking off the branches like, what? Who gives their kid a machete when they're four or five? That is just insane. But in most of the world, especially in the time of Jesus, everyone carried a weapon. And he specifically says, when someone slaps you on the right cheek, you know where your right cheek is? How does someone slap you on that cheek? They use their left hand. Where's their weapon? Their weapon's in their right hand. And Jesus says, turn the other cheek. The only way they can slap you on the other cheek is to put their weapon down. And so Jesus is talking a strategy. He's not talking about just falling apart and being a doormat. So scripture gives light to scripture. John chapter 18, verses 19 through 23. John cha I should have marked all these little papers. So Sorry, I'm fumbling. John chapter 18. You probably would never put these two sections together. Maybe you would, but maybe not. John chapter 18, verses 19 through 23. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. Jesus is speaking here. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is that the way you answer the high priest, he said? He didn't turn the other cheek. If I said something wrong, Jesus said, tell me what it is. If I spoke the truth, why did you hit me? He talked back. What? <laughs> Whoa. Now, I could understand if I dug something out of the Old Testament and it was Zechariah or somebody in the Old Testament. But this is Jesus in both cases. 
He says, when someone slaps you on the, sh on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. That's the first verse always quoted in these kinds of issues about how do we use power? When do we stand up against evil? What are we supposed to do when somebody hurts us or someone that we love? Turn the other cheek. That's, a, that's the first statement. But Jesus didn't do that. So what does he mean? It's not just a reaction. It's a response. And he's prepared to respond. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus and the 12 are headed for Jerusalem. This is before Palm Sunday. They're on their way prior to the crucifixion. The Samaritan villages refused to let these Jewish guys stay in their town. James and John, two brothers who have been disciples for three years, say to Jesus, these people don't deserve to live. Would you like us to call down fire out of heaven and burn them up? And Jesus rebukes his own disciples for their attitude. He says, let's just go on to the next village, okay? It's very amazing. So the first issue is to be reactive or to be responsive. I think in the first council when Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and you're caught unaware. Someone slaps you on the face. Catch your breath. Ask them to be defenseless. Turn the other cheek. That's a reaction. But when he has time to respond, it's very interesting. He doesn't just say, pick up whatever weapon you have and go for it. It's a deeper issue that has to do with who's involved, what's happening, and why? I don't have an answer. Let's just keep going. The second big uh, differential that I want to present to you is the difference between an international issue and a personal issue. We can think about the theory of what should happen to Russia versus Ukraine, but ultimately, the real, the real struggle that we have over this is what do I do in my life when conflict happens? Well, not necessarily just about somebody hitting or shooting or stabbing or, or injuring somebody else. It's when they speak meanly, when they bully a child, when, when, when an elder person is abused, when somebody who doesn't have power or position in, in, in our personal walk, how do we respond to that? There is certainly this international issue that we grapple with, but the very same issue is also personal. Here's something that I found in my study through this. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm digging all over the place trying to figure out how to solve this issue. Hebrews 11 is the great chapter of faith. What does it mean to have faith in God, to walk with God, to trust in him, to, uh, to trust our future, our past, our present into his hands? The writer to the Hebrews is pulling all the stops out to try and communicate as clearly as possible how do you live by this concept of faith? How do you do it? And as an example, this is what the writer to the Hebrew says in 11, 32 through 34. What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, or Jephthah, about David, or Samuel, or any of the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flame, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Why in the world would he quote that concept about faith? It turned their weakness into courage. They were able to defeat armies and rescue their land, that was an example of the faith 
that we ought to live by? It's just, is that a double message? Are we splitting hairs here? It's a very fascinating issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8, Paul is talking about speaking in tongues. And he says, what you say must be clear. Like a trumpet calling people to battle. Unless the sound is a clear call, who will know to get ready for battle? Wait a minute. Where's the nonviolent? I mean, why would he even use that example, use anything else? How will the cows know to come home unless you ring the bell clearly? I mean, anything else. How will your kids know to do their chores unless you tell them clearly? No, he says, how will you know to get ready for battle unless the trumpet is clearly sounded? It's just such an odd issue, and it comes up actually over and over, even in the New Testament. Be ready for battle, but not battle the way the world does battle. In 1918, World War I ended. It was the entire world of East A West Asia, all of Europe, and the United States fighting against... Germany, the Kaiser, and his desire to dominate the entire world. 1918. In 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed by all the parties, and Germany was demilitarized completely. They weren't even allowed to have sharp implements to till their ground with, because the world said, you're going to just turn them into weapons. 1924... Adolf Hitler had been put in jail for starting fights in beer halls. He was on early release for good behavior. And in 1924, he went out and got a bunch of young men that were sitting around in the street doing nothing and formed the Nazi party. In 1938, 10 years, 12 years later, Germany annexed the Sudetenland by an agreement because they were afraid of what he was going to do. In 1939, since the world didn't do anything, he invaded Poland and it started World War II. And we didn't get involved for two more years until we absolutely had to. When's the right time to use power against evil? That, that became, that's, that's in this generation is our grandparents are still alive that remember those issues and the struggle of standing up against evil. What if we had stood up earlier? But we don't know. And the same thing is happening now. So let's go on to the last issue. Aggressive versus defensive power. This is another gigantic issue. It's not just be as powerful as you can and go around manipulate and control everybody. But when it's defensive, when there are those who are innocents, three million people have left their homes at least and gone to another country in Ukraine. At least three million. But the number of people displaced within Ukraine is millions more. They're defenseless. No one is able to stand for them except themselves, and we're supplying some weapons. But one of the things that's very interesting, one, and it's happened many times, one of the issues that is breaking the hearts of the Russian warriors is that when they're hungry, Ukrainian mothers are bringing sandwiches on plates to their enemies. And some of the young Russians, they're saying to each other, why are we doing this? They should only want to kill us, but they're coming with plates of food and bottles of water when that could be for their own. It's, it is such a confusing time. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34, don't think that I came to bring peace. 
I came to bring a sword. That's weird. He says that. In Luke 22, at the end of the Last Supper, Jesus says to the 11, Judas has left by this point, he says to the 11, when you went out before, in the Luke chapter 9, you went out to do witnessing and share, did you lack anything? You didn't take a purse, you didn't take extra clothes, you just went out, preached kingdom is coming, did you lack anything? They said no. Jesus says, this time, take your cloak, take your extra tunic. And then he makes a very odd statement, Luke 22, verse 34. If you don't have a sword, buy one. And if you have to, sell your second coat so that you can afford it. That's Luke 22, 36. In Luke 22, 49... 13 verses later, they're coming to arrest Jesus. And Luke says, Peter pulled his sword out and started slashing away and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. John says that's Malchus. And Jesus says, not that way, Peter, and heals his ear. I thought he said, have a sword. What? So so the scripture doesn't give us the simple answer. Lay down and be a doormat. Arm yourself with all the armor you're ever going to need and go on the offensive. It doesn't say either one. But the struggle is how do we then live in this age? So here's my final question. What if this was happening to your kid? I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be the ultimate nonviolent person. The idea of somebody came after me, would I punch them back? I've actually been punched and hit. I don't strike back. I've had things stolen from me. I don't steal back. I don't get all bent out of shape. Against me? Okay. But come after my kids? Come after my grandkids? In my own mind, I would kill somebody who's trying to kill my kids. I don't like that. I don't understand it. But if some maniac, truly evil person for no other reason than the psychotic joy of slaughtering other people came into my home to kill my kids or my grandkids, would not, I would not hesitate. So how do you work that out? When... When do we do something? When nuclear bombs are dropped? When they go after Poland? Do we wait? I I don't know the answer. I don't even know the questions. But now is the time to learn how to be responsive and not just reactive. Even in our Bible study group, We had one person on the bell curve that said, I would never take up a weapon. I would die. I would let my family die. I would watch my children be murdered. I would not fight back. And we had another person in the room that said, if they raised a hand against my family, they'd be dead before their hand came down. Very interesting. And somewhere in the middle is where we live. So I present the challenge of the question. And for us here, it's largely theoretical. But for our brothers and sisters who are kneeling and praying in bombed churches, this is real. Let's pray together. Father,
we really don't know how to solve this. There are people tonight that are just praying that the enemy just falls over dead. Well, that would be simple. That would be, if you just kind of snatch his heart right out of his body and he'd fall over, boy, that, that would convince the whole world. But you don't do that. We don't want to just react, caught in a corner, fight like an animal, or just give up and die. We don't want to, we want to be wise. We want to know why we are acting the way we act. Jesus said, when you're slapped, turn the other cheek. When he was slapped, he asked questions. This is really tough. And most questions, we can find a verse and it solves it for us. Not this one. So even while we struggle, walk with us. Let us walk with you. And to know how we should live in these days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.